Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division at the Library of Congress. And I'm really pleased to have Christophe Rousset here uh, to speak with us about the program of uh, Le Talon Lyrique tonight. Um, and in uh, particular, uh, the celebration of a major Couperin anniversary. Um, so please join me in welcoming Christophe Rousset. Um, I thought maybe as a way to start our conversation, um, and I'm sure that there will be uh, questions from the audience as well, but that we could start by talking about what you've been up to this year is in this big anniversary uh, to celebrate Couperin. Well, we, ha we have been uh, essentially touring a, a little world, uh, around the world uh, with Coupera, and we've been also uh, recording a lot of Coupera, so we've done Les Nations, uh, Les Concerts Royaux, uh, and, and um, so it's important to, uh, to try to defend this composer uh, who is um, major in the French music. Uh, it is... Um, not as known as uh, Rameau, probably because he never wrote operas uh, and uh, his way of expressing himself is always in an intimate way. So uh, when it's not for harpsichord or solo organ, it is for small ensembles. It's never for orchestra or, or big, uh, big, uh, big choral, choir, choir music or things like that. It's always kind of the intimate forms. Um, the major change that Couperin made in music, in French music, was to change the place, the, 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 the position of, of the musician and the performer in, in in general, that's to say, he, wa he was uh, keen on marking uh, at the beginning of the pieces characters he wanted for the piece. So that would, of course, change the attitude of the, of the, of, of the player. Uh, so very often it was kind of uh, tendrement, so with tenderness, amoureusement, with love, uh, voluptuousement with volupti uh, and so so many other ones um, so um, of course for for a, for a performer it's it asks it's it uh, forces you to to give something a little more personal of yourself and it also uh, makes the the listener in a different position. That's to say you are supposed to uh, receive this tenderness as, as, a, as a listener. You, you are part of the conversation. And, uh, and that's, that's very important and that's very new in, in French music. That's to say, uh, obviously the, the musician was, was, uh, was a kind of a court, uh, figure and uh, and uh, it was to be supposed to be polite music, well educated and uh, not making the ego too uh, present as as in Italian music. Italian music is more about ego, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and French music is different. It's uh, more civilized, <laughs> um, <coughs> polite elegant uh, and uh, and um, it's very often based on dance huh? so uh, but in Coupra also you you can recognize very often the dancers uh, in the in the title pieces uh, but but Coupra so puts more if he puts he puts something a little more egotic uh, but in a very civilized way, and y y we have to to wait for uh, the 1730s to see a change in in uh, in solo compositions in French music, like Rameau. Rameau changed quite a lot the way of playing the harpsichord, 
but also Leclerc for the violin uh, developed a very fiery technique for the violin and uh, the, uh, the writing for the violin is incredible and uh, and very and very virtuosistic so so um, the obviously around the 30s when Coupra more or less stopped writing and died in the in 33 uh, the cha the change of style and the way of writing is is big that's how his music was a little forgotten after his uh, his death and monsieur couperin in paris in the 50s was not couperin le grand but his uh, his nephew uh, armand louis uh, who wrote in the new rameau style for the harpsichord but rameau took uh, uh, some of those uh, that descriptive types of titling and, and things like that. Uh. Surely, so Couperin introduced also the titles for the pieces, that's to say he was describing all uh, persons, uh, so he would, he would make some portraits of, uh, of, uh, of people around him, musicians or maybe nobleties, uh, but also Evocations of nature, uh, the birds, uh, perhaps a shepherdess, uh, uh, les petites crinières de Bagnolet, for instance. <laughs> so, so it's 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 it, it evocates things, but sometimes it's very mysterious, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't really know uh, what's the meaning of it. Uh, but he says in his preface that. Uh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't ask him about, about the titles. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have to explain himself about the, about the titles. He doesn't want to explain himself and he, he wants the, the, the mystery to, to remain. Um, he liked also the wit. Uh, you have, uh, you have a humoristic uh, descriptions uh, in, in uh, comment ça s'appelle le, le, le fast de la grande et ancienne ministrandise in the in the eleventh order and uh, and you have um, you have very funny descriptions um, also in the in the apotheosis mm -hmm. he made for Lili and, and Corelli you have obviously very comic situations he describes so uh, the titles are important uh, they are a motor of, of inspiration also for the player that's to say he has to take also the flavor of the of the title to uh, try to make his interpretation a little richer uh, in the concert of tonight, I will play, for instance, in the seventh order, uh, les petits âges, so ages. Uh, so you have the birth, you have the, the, the infants, and you have the adolescence, and then you have les délices. So adult age is actually about delights. Uh? <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, a way of being witty. And, uh, and, uh, and yes, that's the French spirit, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> In the description of love, you have uh, the Il Ritratto dell'Amore in the Ligure Unie. So it's the portrait of love. And, so, and you, have, you have a suite with titles like La Vivacité, La Tendresse, L'Elegance, uh, I don't know what. And the last piece is Let's the etc. <laughs> so just. <laughs> well, this is kind of an interesting program because it gives us uh, a bit of a, a, a portrait or an introduction into the various types of music that Couperin was writing, and um, which is a, a real treat, especially to hear some of this vocal music as well as um, instrumental music. But one thing I was wondering, uh, since you played all of this, um, and since we're talking about music that's of a more intimate nature, how does uh, Couperin handle, uh, you know, looking at his uh, solo keyboard writing, there's a lot of specificity in terms of ornamentation and things mm -hmm. like that. It's very clear, at least it seems like uh, comparatively at the time. Um, how does that uh, 
does that uh, type of approach to the writing um, hold over into the other uh, types of music that you'll be playing tonight, the, 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 the opening work? Well, actually, it's, uh, it's a very good question because, because uh, Kupra uh, didn't play anything else than keyboards. So he was an organ player. He was uh, in title of, uh, of the, of the Ch Royal Chapel in Versailles. He was chosen by, by the king himself to be uh, an organ uh, organist in the in the in the chapel, he had the organ in uh, in Par Paris in Saint, -Ger Saint Gervais, so he was he was a, a fantastic organ player. We just have two books for the for the organ, but they are uh, a, a amongst the best uh, ever written for the for the organ, the, the French organ. Uh, and of course, the harpsichord, he composed four books, a very important books for the harpsichord. But he didn't play anything else. He didn't, he didn't play violin as, as other composers, like Rameau, for instance. Rameau played violin, and he even played violin in Italy, <laughs> in orchestras there to make money. Uh, but uh, but Couperin did, didn't. So he, he wrote for the violin, he wrote for the, for the flute and, and the gamba, but, but uh, when he writes for the gamba, for instance, you will hear some, some, some gamba music tonight, uh, he actually thinks a color, instrumental color, so the gamba is of course the color he wants, but he writes like a, for harpsichord actually, every, every single note of his music is thought on harpsichord. <laughs> And you, when you play the gamba music on a harpsichord, it just feels very natural. But ask a gamba player, it's just <laughs> very <laughs> tricky. <laughs> Everything is like, oh. <laughs> it doesn't, it, 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 it's not an instrumental writing. It's just an ideal uh, writing. The same for the, for the Leçon de Ténèbres, the vocal music you will hear tonight. There are fantastic pieces, I mean, probably amongst the more inspired uh, church music in the 18th century French music. But it's uh, unvocal. <laughs> uh, it has no room for a singer to take breath. breath. Uh, it's exactly as, as for Bach cantatas. Bach is, uh, you know, developing big, big vocal music and there is no way to breathe <laughs> in his music. So it's a torture for the singers, but of course it's so beautiful that's that they they love singing it and torturing themselves <laughs> to uh, to uh, sing those those beautiful beautiful, and especially in the letters you will hear tonight. And so the lamentation, the the leçon de ténèbres are the, the lamentation on Jeremiah. Um, uh, Lamentations, but every every single uh, section is opened by a letter, a, 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 a bright letter. Uh, so it's a kind of a abstract line on a, a sound, <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, something really magic. It's 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 so plastic. You see a line. In the in in the space, it's it's really something really special, and uh, you have something magic also in Charpentier, but not as beautiful as uh, those three lessons. It's really something special. The um, there was I've, I think I've read maybe it was in, in the notes that that you gave us um, that there were six missing ones, or that there. Supposedly, unfortunately. So, uh, when he published the the three uh, lessons you you will hear tonight, he says I composed them for the for the Abbey Longchamp. So the it's uh, an abbey near Paris, and uh, of course when you when you uh, compose a cycle of Leçon de Ténèbres, lamentations for the for the Holy Week, for the Holy Week. Uh, there are nine of them uh, because there are three days. You are supposed to sing three lessons on uh, Wednesday, three on Thursday, and three on 
Friday, and uh, and uh, he kept in his publication saying that I will publish the the remaining uh, Le Centenaire in the future very soon, maybe next month, <laughs> maybe next year, maybe the <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he never did actually, mm. and uh, and uh, that's a big loss. Mm. I hope in this library somewhere, hidden. I was going to say that we we've discovered people find things all the time. Uh, very uh, recently, yeah. the only remaining uh, uh, autograph uh, manuscript of uh, Couperin mm. has been discovered in this very uh, library. I so did not realize that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic Oops. because we had no autograph of uh, Couperin, <laughs> and the only one is, yeah. What do you remember? What it was? Off we are yeah. very jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's, a, it's just a, a, um, an air for bass. Mm. Uh, it's a, just a vocal line with no no uh, bass continue, no no bass uh, uh, accompaniment. Mm. Just the solo vocal line, and uh, it's very simple. And it has a, a little text mm. above it, so it's obviously. In integrated in a in a letter actually mm -hmm. in a in a, um, in a in brief and mm -hmm. uh, and it's signed Coupin, so yeah. it's it must must be him. Wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I wanted to, to just bring up uh, also since we're talking a bit about this, and I just want to pick your brain a little bit because you know so much about this uh, material, is the relationship between uh, the type of freedom. That you have like the unmeasured preludes of Louis Couperin and other mm -hmm. others that are doing that, um, versus the type of freedom that is given to uh, the choice of instrumentation, say in the Conservatorio. The um, have you done? Um, uh, ha can you speak to any of those types of choices that are left to uh, the musicians? Um, yes, that's an interesting question as well. Uh, so Louis Couperin, uh, you are talking about was his great uncle. Uh, and he has written the most uh, extraordinary uh, prelude non mesuré, that's to say unmeasured prelude, that's to say with no bar lines, no rhythms, and it's all white with the <laughs> uh, notes like that on the, on the s uh, staves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, so you have to improvise, you have to invent an interpretation. When he writes preludes, uh, Couperin has written eight preludes for, for the harpsichord. He says some are measured, some are completely free and feel free. <laughs> so he puts rhythms, but you have to feel free in this music to just uh, make your own interpretation. Uh, freedom is also, as you said, in the in the instruments. So that's to say, when when he says continuo, bas basso continuo, so the true ba bass on uh, accompanying, uh, you can put a theobo, you can put an organ, you can put a, a harpsichord. That's your choice, uh, and the same for for the. The Concert Royaux, for instance, the, the, the piece you will hear tonight at the beginning of the program is, he says in his preface, it's for harpsichord, of course, <laughs> but you can play it on the violin, on the flute, on the oboe, on the bassoon, on ev every kind of instrument, melodical instrument. So it's, it, it's, it's free for the, for the performer, but, uh, but of course, it, it makes the music sound so different, yeah. so it's a, it's a fundamental <laughs> choice, really. <laughs> Have you done many different configurations or different versions of these types of works, or do you t typically go with a particular? Well, uh, I've, I've been playing the Concert Royaux on the harpsichord. I've, I've, I've recorded them on the harpsichord, but, but I play them, them tonight, for instance, uh, with, the, with the violin and the kamba. Uh, so it's, it makes a completely different flavor. But uh, he says himself, he, he performed for the king, the dying uh, Louis XIV uh, in his chamber. Uh, he was playing himself the harpsichord and he names all the players. Mm. Um, so we know who played with him mm. in the chamber of, uh, of Louis XIV. So wow. that's very touching. <laughs> Um, 
maybe you can tell us a bit more just uh, before we uh, uh, move on to other projects that you're up to these days. Um, you recently were writing ab about Kubran, and um, maybe you could say a bit about what that was about or what, what your topic was in particular. Uh, it was a book of, on Kubran, <laughs> and, uh, and um, I, I, as I am a performer, I wanted to, to, uh, to give a personal approach on, on the composer and not, not uh, a book uh, a scholar could have written. So it's, it's more about what I find in this music and uh, how I appreciate it and how sometimes I might be critical uh, <laughs> to, uh, towards Couperin uh, and especially to his personality. Um, it's strange for a, a composer of that time to talk about himself so much. So he's, he asks, as I said uh, at the beginning of this talk, uh, he asks the, the, the performer to be egotic, but he was obviously very egotic, and, uh, and he talks about himself, about his health, for instance, in his preface for the harpsichord pieces. And we don't really care about his health. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but he says, I've been so sick, I'm sorry. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't publish my, my book of uh, harpsichord pieces. Or I've been so busy traveling between Versailles and Paris. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I've been so busy. And I'm <laughs> so important somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, so he's, uh, he's talking about himself. He's writing about himself and publishing that in harpsichord books, you are kind of surprised, no? Um, or in the, in the fourth book, the last book, he says, well, I'm very sick, and um, so sorry for the delay of, uh, of the publication, but, uh, but I, I will probably die, and, uh, and um, I published this, this book, uh, with the, the hope that perhaps the glory will uh, survive more than my own life mm. and it's, uh, things like this. So he's, uh, he's kind of uh, talking about his own glory and, um, you know, like regret maybe uh, after his death. And, well, I don't have this, uh, the precise uh, stage uh, qu uh, quote, but, uh, but it's, um, it's something very special. Uh, and he says some pieces have been lost during the, the preparation of the, of the book, uh, but I won't compose them again uh, because I'm too tired. <laughs> you know, s things like that. It's, uh, it's quite touching, but, uh, but strange. And also, he has written a, a treatise for the harpsichord, the, the art of playing the harpsichord, L'art de toucher le clavecin. And um, he says, it's, in, it's incidentally uh, something really funny. He says, uh, you should always have a very well quilt harpsichord. It's very important to have something really even and, uh, and, um, and perfect. Uh, but it's true that some players don't care so much and they can, they can play on good regulated, uh, well-regulated instruments and bad regulated instruments because, because they equally play bad on good and bad instruments. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's strange to, to read this in, uh, in, a, in a serious book uh, on harpsichord. So he's really, you know, like <laughs> conscious, self-conscious. <laughs> By the way, we have a first edition of that out on display in the other room. Fantastic. So you can take a look at that, and, and it's fun. It's fun. From 1713, is that right? I think, yeah. Yes. Well, or 1717, uh, is that? 17 or 17. 16, yeah, there are two editions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not the first edition, but one of the <laughs> editions, we'll, you could find out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, a lot of... Uh, you have such a wide range of work that you do, uh, you know, 
from solo harpsichord music to opera. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that a lot of our audience are, f are familiar with, um, with your recordings and um, probably heard you live. What other types of projects are you working on now or in the near future coming up? Well, in the near, near future, I'm, I'm working on the Salieri uh, French opera. Uh, Salieri, so everybody knows uh, the name of Salieri because of the film on, uh, on <laughs> Mozart. But actually, Salieri is a big genius and he's a fantastic composer. And the image the movie gives on, on his character is, well, might be true on the character, but surely not on the music. Mm. Uh, so his music is really something important in music history. And um, he has been invited to Paris uh, through the Queen uh, Marie Antoinette. So Salieri was uh, active in Vienna, as you know. Uh, but he was a close friend to Gluck. Gluck came back from Paris. Uh, he, he felt so, so offended because of the failure of his last French opera, Echo et Narcisse, and went back to Paris uh, and said, I will never come back to that terrible city. So, uh, so he left, and, uh, but he, ha he has been offered to compose an opera uh, in French again for Paris, but from Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, so the libretto uh, traveled and went, was sent to Vienna for, for Gluck. And uh, Gluck was, was really angry against Paris and said, no, I don't want to write that opera. And he gave it to Salieri. And Salieri composed the music for Les Danaïdes. Mm -hmm. So that was the first French opera of, uh, of Salieri, but under the name of uh, Gluck. So he presented a Gluck opera with um, his own music in Paris. It, wa it has been a huge success and then published it in Paris under his own name, so Les Danaïdes by Salieri. So as it has been a big success, he was offered to compose two more operas. So Les, Les Horas, I've just uh, recorded and, uh, and released uh, on CD. It was completely unperformed in the, in the modern era, so it was a big discovery and it's beautiful, uh, beautiful um, uh, opera. And the third one is Tarar, and so I'm working on Tarar, and I will perform and record it um, uh, end of November, the beginning of uh, December. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. It's an opera based on a Beaumarchais libretto, so it's quite interesting. And it's uh, written in 1787, so two years before the French Revolution. And what's said in, uh, in the libretto is very revolutionary, mm. I must say. So it's kind of uh, death to the kings and, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like <laughs> quite, um, hmm. uh, so um, it's, um, it's quite um, a surprise that this opera hasn't been uh, forbidden mm. by, the, by the censure. Uh, as the the Figaro's marriage was was actually uh, censor, censored, mm -hmm. but um, but he ha it hasn't, and uh, and it has be, uh, been a, a huge success at the at the time. So so, uh, Beaumarchais was a fan of uh, Salieri's music. He says so in in his uh, letters, and uh, so we are very excited about this project. It's a huge huge opera, uh, number of uh, soloists dances, choirs, uh, it's very long, but um, very interesting. I think it's wonderful that you uh, go for the underdog a bit as well, <laughs> for, the, for the lesser known, or the people who should be, music. the music is still great. And well, still it's right. actually a little uh, my speciality, and uh, when people are desperate to find a conductor to, to you know, to <laughs> <laughs> conduct uh, an opera by, uh, who knows who, uh, <laughs> Meul, uh, uh, very unknown piece. Oh, there is always <laughs> Christophe Fousset <laughs> for that. So uh, that's a little my, uh, my speciality, yes, sure, my sure. label. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I thought maybe we could open it up to a few audience questions if you have a few more minutes. Um, do we have any questions? If you do, if you could wait for a, uh, a microphone to get to you. Question, the Couperin text that's out in the, uh, the entrance area to the auditorium, is it, a, is it an annotated version uh, of the comments that you were just giving uh, about Couperin and his comments on, on the music and his life and his health and so forth, or were those not incorporated in it's a later edition of uh, the, the text? The, the mentions of uh, his health are always in prefaces. Uh, uh -huh. to, to his works, always, not, not in his uh, treatise. The treatise is really something about uh, teaching uh, uh, young children or uh, uh, as a, he says, for instance, men play uh, the harpsichord less, less well than, than women because women don't work with their hands. So huh. the hands are oh, really? more flexible. <laughs> he really? says so. Or um, close a harpsichord after giving a lesson to a to a, a, a child because uh, he could ruin uh, the whole work of uh, of the teacher uh, in two minutes. So it's better that he he wouldn't play by himself. Uh, he says. Um, before playing, ask somebody to uh, pull all your finger because it makes your spirits in motion. <laughs> <laughs> Things like this. So it's 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 a very interesting treatise, yeah. <laughs> and some some of the of the sentences are mysteries even for a French speaking <laughs> people. Really, it's uh, sometimes you don't really understand the point of what he says, but uh, it's uh, it's very. Tasty, I'd say. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the solo work for harpsichord that you're performing this evening. The, uh, the final movement of Les Amusements has a different character or mood, as I hear it, than the movements that immediately precede it. Uh, les paysages uh, has one feeling you you hear the growth the moving through life as it were and les amusements is very different and as someone who maybe when I hear your performance tonight I'll feel differently but I was wondering if you had any comment about that final movement of the work well uh depends how you play it, of course. Uh, and obviously the, the indications we have of character or, or what, what, what the, the title or the piece uh, tells you is still not enough. So obviously in, uh, in romantic music or modern music even more, we have a really uh, clear interpretation given by the composer. Here, it's difficult uh, to uh, really decide yourself on an interpretation. So you can do this piece in a very dreamy way. You can do it in a very determined way. <laughs> you can change the re registration, that's to say, Th that's the freedom of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the performer. So what kind of sound you will get from your harpsichord is also free. Uh, obviously there is a big contrast between the major and the minor section. Uh, do you have an idea all, all on, on the interpretation of amusement? Why it's called des amusements, for instance? I have one. I can give you my interpretation. It's actually a piece written in three, which is actually beaten, if you hear it, in two. So it's It's 
sounds like this. And it's written. So when you first read it, you think, huh? <laughs> why those bar lines? But obviously, that's the, the, his amusement. <laughs> so what he found amusing is actually to lose a little the idea of bar lines, I think. Uh, that's his way of being amused. <laughs> I don't know how much you can be amused without the music. <laughs> but um, but um, I think that's, that's what he what he means with, uh, with um, the amusement. Um, and yes, the, my interpretation, you will hear it tonight, but it is, uh, is uh, more based on the, on the singing lines and the trying to, to be as uh, dreamy as possible. That's, that's my way. Uh, it's difficult to find a, a unity in a in an ordre de frein. Uh, I think that there, there, there isn't. There is the key, mostly, and the the idea of suite, which is the arch, the normal arch of the suite. But in the seventh, for instance, there is no suite. So it's a it's a kind of a character pieces one after the other, and uh, so the most, the most dancing one is the la, la Basque, huh? so it's obviously a dance of uh, Basque people. <laughs> I don't know which one, but <laughs> it has this uh, kind of uh, popular uh, flavor. Uh, and the rest are all portraits, like Menetou or the Vauvray, the yes it's uh, it's a portrait and the the rest are, are just images or evocation of uh, the ages for instance yeah, maybe I can follow up on this for just a moment though I remember when we first started speaking you, you mentioned how Bigger role that, that dance played in this type. I know that you've done some work, or at least I believe you've done some work where you do solo harpsichord music with dance. Or yeah. so, um, does that? Uh, what is that uh, interface like? Does that change uh, your approach to the music a great deal? Or absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and uh, for instance, for the for the the gavotte or the the sarabande. Uh, when I've seen uh, a gavotte danced or a sarabande danced, you suddenly understand how it's structured, where are the, the, the strong beats. For instance, I don't know if you are here musicians or players. Uh, I've been told that the accent in a sarabande is on the second beat, and actually it's not, it's not. Uh, when you see it danced and you see the original choreographies, the, the, the accent is always on the first beat, and then there is a kind of a balance, point of balance in the, in the second beat. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, and the structure is four bars. So that's, that's of course, is something you you know, it just, just opens your ears and, and your mind ab about, about how to, uh, to make the, the flow of music uh, clearer. Um, I could today write uh, Art de Toucher de Clavecin myself <laughs> about what I found on the harpsichord and how I play it. Uh, and you will probably notice that tonight, is that I try to uh, make forget that the harpsichord is a type machine-like instrument or uh, <laughs> a mechanical thing or 
an expressive instrument, and I try to sing with the with the with the instrument. So obviously, Couperin wanted the same as he says he says tendrement or things like that. You have to find the way to be tender on a harpsichord, uh, and he invented signs to uh, to make the harpsichord a little more expressive. Uh, but obviously, the, the way of making the harpsichord expressive, mostly, is the what the 18, uh, 19th century calls uh, rubato, and what we would say uh, in the, this music, ad agogic. That's to say the tension, the way of going up in tension and release it. So that's the... That's the the arch of uh, of the 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 phrase. So when you have four bars together in a sarabande, for instance, you want to give this idea of four bars. Uh, mostly, when you play on harpsichord a sarabande, you hear bling 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 bling. That's to say, accent on every single beat. So it doesn't give much. So if a composer gives a big arpeggio, maybe you have a blam, bing, bing, blam, bing, bing. But uh, still, to make an arch out of it is not easy. So the way to do it is just to cheat. <laughs> I can't explain it better. So that's the way to just give a, a hierarchy. Hierarchy. Yeah. Hierarchy, yeah. Hierarchy yeah. On, uh, of, of what's important and what's not, and, and make forget all the accents the harpsichord naturally gives. Uh, so that's not an easy job, <laughs> but uh, there are some harpsichordists for that. <laughs> well, I think unless we have one more quick question, oh, we're just about out of time. Uh, I wondered if uh, you mentioned Rameau, if there was any influence either way between Rameau's Trias of Harmony and uh, Couperin, if there's, as far as their harmonic language? Oh, I think, I think Rameau, well, Rameau never uh, gave any kind of mention on Couperin's music, so he mentions, he mentions many of his predecessors or contemporaries, but Coupra doesn't exist, strangely. Uh, the same for, for Coupra uh, towards Rameau. Huh? Rameau doesn't exist. <laughs> they used to live in the same street, <laughs> Rue des Bons Enfants, but they ignored each other in a spectacular way. <laughs> Uh, you have, for instance, uh, hom homage to uh, uh, Forqueret. Huh? So you have a piece written by Rameau, La Forqueret, fantastic piece in the Pièce de Clavecin en Concert. You have a wonderful Allemande called La Forqueret in the third book of Couperin. Huh? You have, in uh, Forqueret, you have La Rameau, you have La Couperin. <laughs> so the homage are done in both sides and uh, both ways, but Couperin and Rameau, they <laughs> ignore them, them, uh, them uh, just each other in a way really, which is to me suspicious. So my interpretation is that Rameau never had the poetry of, uh, of Couperin, never could find the finesse to me. Uh, so to my heart, Couperin is much superior. Rameau uh, has a, a very intellectual way of, uh, of conceiving music and probably looked at the harpsichord pieces and said, hmm, octaves, oh, what's this harmony that's not in my catalog of harmonies? <laughs> because actually Rameau 
of course, was a, a genius of harmony and made a fantastic catalog of it and ma made a, a incredible treaties on it, but excluded a few harmonies Couperin was using. And Couperin was in advance uh, for his time, actually. You find some harmonies you will find in the Ra uh, Ravel or, or the BC, uh, adding adding forth, adding, you know, like very strange things, especially in uh, L'Arlequin, La, um, if you want a very special example. And the, the harmonies you find in L'Arlequin are not catalogued in Would, would Couperin have read Rameau's treatise? Possibly, but probably <laughs> ignored it, like <laughs> bull. <laughs> so uh, he was he was probably not taking any notice on on this young uh, arrogant composer because he was much younger than Couperin, huh? and Couperin had the fame, had the position, and uh, Rameau came and uh, wanted to just change everything, and uh, he did it before, strangely enough, the death of Couperin. But I don't think there is any relation between the two. Between the <laughs> oh, let's make a movie on it. <laughs> Actually, Rameau killed. <laughs> killed Coupra. No, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Rameau's fame came through his operas. And the first opera written by Rameau was in 1733. So the, exactly the, the year of, uh, of Couperin's death. But um, obviously, Rameau is held as more important because of the treaties of harmony, because of the of the of the pieces. I mean, the, the the harpsichord pieces with the high virtuosity, and because of the operas, obviously, because they are very high high quality. Uh, but the poetry you find in uh, in Couperin is unique, absolutely unique, and uh, and. Uh, as a conclusion, because uh, because I will probably uh, finish uh, with this, I will say he's trying to talk to your hearts, but not in general. He wants every one of you open their hearts and receive his message. Eh? It's a very intimate thing. So open your hearts and try to uh, to uh, <laughs> taste taste what he gives you, which is rare, uh, very sensitive, very sophisticated, I would say. And I very often compare this comp this music to a beautiful uh, soap bubble. So it's beautiful you know, with all these colors and uh, flies like this, but it's very fragile. If you touch it in the wrong way, it just disappears. And this music is about this. This music is very fragile. If you play it brutally, it doesn't happen. If you play it on piano, it doesn't happen. If you play uh, uh, on the cello, it doesn't happen. If, 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 you don't, if you don't have a lot of care and a lot of love to it, it doesn't happen. It's, it's a very, very special uh, message and very uh, fine thing. Huh? So be sophisticated also in your way of listening and you will get it. Otherwise, sorry. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you.